welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is the daily show where we give you all of the latest news from the Woo! world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us, as always, is John Campion. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. And we are so pleased you decided to make us part of your day. Also here, Christian Harloff. So. <laughs> <laughs> what a thug. Also here, Mark Ellis. And I am clearly dressed to go see Creed, which I'm going to do later on today with you, gentlemen. <laughs> Cannot wait. I that, saw it, loser. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired of me calling a loser on this show. Every it's day, happening a lot. Me a loser. <laughs> um, hey, listen, folks, as happens sometimes, a little piece of movie news dropped after we already got the show notes all prepared. The new Red Band trailer for the Robert De Niro, Zac Efron film, Bad Grandpa, just dropped. A lot of us have been scratching our heads a bit, wondering if this film was going to be any good. Anyway, we just had a chance to watch a trailer. Christian, you just watched it with us. Your thoughts about the Bad Grandpa Red Band trailer. I loved this trailer. I laughed more at this trailer than I have most comedies this year. I <laughs> think that this is a, a role I cannot wait to see De Niro in. He looks like he's having so much fun doing it i am so scared because i feel like this is what i'm gonna be like at 70 years old it is you're like that now <laughs> true um but it just the the lines everything that he's saying it's it, it's like taking a, this this is the role i want to see um zach efron do as well too the fact that he like we know the kid has talent he's been in some crap movies but to go up against someone like de niro in a comedy he's good at comedy i, I i'm really excited for this movie i laughed a lot Christian, all day, or I say, Mark, all every day this week, there's been a new trailer, and you've hated them all. Uh, yeah. So you just you just got to see the Bad Grandpa one. What did you think of it? Maybe it's just a bad week for me. I liked the Bad Grandpa trailer. I didn't love it. I was loving it for a while. Watching De Niro, you're right. He looks hysterical in the movie. It could be the performance of the decade for him. The, the, the trailer really lost me about a minute through because it's like, okay, De Niro's great. Everything else just didn't seem that funny or enjoyable to me. So I think the movie could be really funny. I'm probably going to laugh a lot, but the rest of the movie seems like it pales in comparison. I don't just want to see De Niro be great. I want the entire movie to make me laugh. It was just that one character that was doing it in the trailer, nothing else. So I hope Zac Efron is great, and I think it's a great choice for him after We Are Your Friends to be pairing with a friend like Robert De Niro in a different role. I think the movie's going to do well. I just need to see more from it to make me think I'm going to love the film. Thanks, Grandpa. Okay, so in, in one of his recent films, Last Vegas, that he was in with Michael Douglas and Morgan Freeman and Kevin Klein. Robert De Niro played a guy, uh, an old gentleman, whose wife had recently passed away, and the one, intern of his, also. One, one of his close friends is getting married and goes on a bit of a road trip with that friend, ultimately though needs to convince that friend that the person they're marrying isn't really the right person for them. Sounds a lot like bad grandpa, except <laughs> instead of friend, I guess it's his grandson, but, uh, but you know what? I'm going to go with Mark on this. I like this trailer. I didn't overwhelmingly love it, although first minute I overwhelmingly loved it. Me too. Um, and what's the girl from uh, Parks and Rec that... Uh, oh, man. Um, and, uh, Aubrey Plaza. Oh, thank you, Aubrey Plaza. Plaza. Thank you. Go. And of course, uh, Safety Not Guaranteed and uh, a bunch of other things. I loved her in the first part of the trailer. Didn't really like her in the second part of the trailer. I, I, I'm a fan of Aubrey Plaza, so I'm sure I'm going to like it anyway. But let's put it this way. It was better than I thought it was going to be. Um, when I saw Red Band trailer for Bad Grandpa, you know, a lot of times they're swearing for the sake of swearing, but when Robert De Niro does it, it's yeah. got punch and yeah. it's got oomph. So, and for some reason, it just felt very natural. I bet you anything, that's how Robert De Niro talks, like <laughs> all the time. It just felt so damn natural. But that's the way it felt. So if you have not had a chance to see this trailer yet, I highly recommend hop on YouTube, just search for Bad Grandpa Red Band, and uh, it should be the one that dropped today. So take a look for that. Um, hey, listen, before we get into the first story today, I should probably let you guys know, because I've been receiving an insane amount of tweets and Facebook messages and emails from people asking me, where is the Star Wars Attack of the Clones commentary? <laughs> uh, we were going to do it this week, but we had a whole bunch of schedule mix-ups that just didn't make it possible. So the Attack of the Clones will be done next week. We're going to actually shoot back to back. I think we're going to shoot Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith back to back. We'll still release them. Don't worry, they will all be out before The Force Awakens hits. Having said that, let's get to the first story of the day. 
All right, well, speaking of Star Wars, the release of the new possibly most highly anticipated film of all time, Star Wars The Force Awakens, will hit theaters in less than a month. Disney and Lucasfilm have just released a brand new TV spot for the film, showing us even more new scenes and footage. John, we know you didn't want to see any more spots for the movie, but what do you think of the new Force Awakens <laughs> Yeah, commercial? no, I was very open about this. I did not want any more trailers, any more spots. If this was not my job, I wouldn't have watched this new trailer spot. I can tell you this right now. Hold on your hats. It's a 30 second commercial. This is the best trailer they put out yet. This is absolutely the best trailer they put out yet and it's only 30 freaking seconds. Everything, you know, we talked a lot about with the first trailer, the second trailer a lot is, you know, unlike a lot of the stuff that's come before it that was had the Star Wars name on it, didn't feel like Star Wars. This more than any other trailer they've done so far felt like Star Wars. I don't know if it was Boyega sitting in that iconic, legendary gunnery pit of the Millennium Falcon. I don't know if it was seeing that, hey, stormtroopers aren't just a bunch of buffoons anymore. They're actually lethal, deadly trained warriors pulling out what I can only assume is like some kind Arrow of blade. theatrical v version of a vibroblade or so their version of or whatever. Clearly. Boyega, because some people, there's been a little bit of debate. Wait, is Boyega, was he already a Jedi at one point? And then it became, clearly, if he's just fighting a stormtrooper and having a hard time with a lightsaber, he's not a Jedi. There's no way Boyega is a Jedi in any sense of the word. But that looked amazing. That whole thing of Solo with, you ready for this? Hell no. Like, I mean, maybe a little Will Smithy there, but I don't care. It worked. It totally worked. I loved this spot. I still don't want to see any more. Please don't make <laughs> me see any more. But I, yeah, my feeling right now is this is the best spot they've put out, bar none, to me, my personal opinion. So I love it. Mark, you had a chance to see it. What do you think? I mean, it's, it's the Force Awakens footage. Of course I love it. I don't think it's the best thing they've ever done as far as Force Awakens trailers go. Maybe because it was only 30 seconds, but you're right. We got a lot in there. I like seeing that this ain't your daddy stormtroopers. These are brand new ones. They know how to fight. They've been trained in weaponry. And seeing John Boyega's character Finn meet Han Solo and see them do, at the precipice of an action scene was just so exciting to me because not only how excited you see Boyega to be in this movie, how excited Harrison Ford is to to be in this movie. I just saw an ad with him this morning where he's he's advertising for charities like, hey, you can come meet me at the premiere if you win tickets. And like how much Harrison Ford is committing to this movie is unprecedented in his career. And he's been in a lot of movies, kids. So the one thing that I didn't love about this trailer as much as I've loved about the other ones was the choice of music here. It was very fast paced. It was actiony. I don't need all the neighborhood kids humming the Star Wars theme. I prefer the John <laughs> Williams, the classic score like we got in the more uh, the, the theatrical trailers as opposed to the TV spots. But this is the right way to sell this movie um i enjoyed it very much i, I think that f the tv spots have been really good uh i i think that the the, the theatrical trailers are still my favorite mm -hmm. i think the international trailer is actually my favorite so far but this one was really cool because it did show that side of the stormtroopers of like okay let's we're not, we we can hit our targets now let's let's <laughs> let's fight um but i really love the, the han solo scene because it's Chewy in the background too. Like he's right. Chewy's like, come on, you guys, stop having your dialogue. Let's go. And then you, you, it's like the, the two vets that have been there before saying to the kid, "Are you ready for Star Wars?" And then he's just like, N "No, but okay, let's go." <laughs> because he, I mean, it's it it said a lot in that trailer um, from what we got. But it, I'm with everyone. No more. Let's go. Let's just, we've, we're like less than a month away now. If they, it's crazy if they to say. Give me more. I'm watching it. I know? know we all will. Well, but yeah, it's like, of course we you But will. we don't yeah. need to anymore. No, it's. it's no. I, I will watch everything that they put. If they put half the movie out tomorrow, I probably watch it. But I don't want to see anything else. Let's just go. But you got to remember, like a lot of people haven't seen. That maybe that, I know that the trailers broke records on the internet and YouTube for how many people watched it. But a lot of people didn't see those theatrical trailers. So if you're watching TV and this is the first spot you see for the Force right. Awakens, it's a great way to sell the picture because there's new characters. It's clearly in the Star Wars universe, and then you see Han Solo and Chewbacca at the end. Now, that, that Stormtrooper could light up that vibro blade and just trip over himself. Like, it'd be kind of <laughs> funny if he did, but I think these Stormtroopers are a lot more badass than we've seen before. All right, what's next? For years now, a Freddie Mercury biopic has started and stalled several times, with Borat actor Sa Sasha Baron Cohen having been attached and then leaving the project due to creative differences. At one point, James Bond Q actor Ben Wishaw was said to be attached, and now it appears things are moving again. According to a report in Deadline, the theory of everything screenwriter Anthony McCartan has joined the project to write the script, and a tentative title has been given to it, Bohemian Rhapsody. The report also says Wishaw is still the top 
top choice to play Mercury, but nothing has been signed yet. Christian, do you like the addition of Anthony McCartan as the screenwriter for Bohemian Rhapsody? Absolutely. I love Theory of Everything. I think that he did a great job in putting together um, the story of Stephen Hawking, so to see what he can do with Freddie Mercury, and it's a, it's, a, it's a movie I've wanted to see for a long time. It's funny, though, when they showed that picture, I still picture... Sasha Baron Cohen. I mean, look, look at that. Uh, That's Sasha Baron Cohen. I know, yeah. I know. It looks just like him. But, but as far as we shot doing it as well, I think he's a, that guy's an amazing actor. But I'm, I'm very interested in this. I want to learn more about Freddie Mercury. I want to see that he was a very, very compelling figure and what he did. Queen's music still, you, you, can't, you hear it everywhere you go. Uh, so yeah, and I, and I like the addition of the writer. I think that he's going to bring a lot to it. Yeah, I'm in the same boat as you. First of all, I like the addition of the screenwriter. I think this is going to bode very well for the project. And maybe we'll finally get to see. They, they've been talking about this movie now for like Forever. four years. Oh, longer that, than that. Long, oh, yeah, yeah, maybe even longer than that. It's just, it's time. And it is a shame that it's not Sasha Baron Cohen. And one of the other reasons why it's a shame is because of why he's not there anymore. Now, the reports I've been reading is that Sasha Baron Cohen really wanted an R-rated film in this. He, and I remember reading him once say, Freddie Mercury's life was not a PG-13 life. Freddie Mercury's life was an R-rated life, and he wanted to capture that. But the people who have final say over this, the surviving members of Queen, and I believe some members of his family who have the veto rights in that, said no, no, no. And then you know they split ways with Sasha Baron Cohen, which is unfortunate. That takes a hit to me because I thought that was the story you needed to tell. That being said, you have the right screenwriter. Uh, ben is a terrific actor, so you can't go wrong there. I. I just want to see them get some movement on this and to see if it's actually going to happen because I'm losing hope this thing's ever going to happen. Anyway, Mark, what about you? The addition of McCartan is big for me because the theory of everything, again, it's based on a true story and he treats that material with respect and he talks and, and it's faithful to the events that actually happened while still being able to be dramatic. So if you can do that with the story of Freddie Mercury, the title Bohemian Rhapsody, I do not love. I'm not a huge, I get it, but I'm not a huge fan of that title being the, the name of the movie. It just sounds like you could call it something better than just one of Queen's songs. I get that Bohemian Rhapsody is kind of the way Freddie Mercury lived his life, but it just seems a little, uh, I, I don't know, uh, fake to me that, oh, we need to name it Bohemian Rhapsody so now people go out and see it. I'm surprised at how much I'm buying Ben Wishaw possibly playing Freddie Mercury because you look at him you're like wait 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 the nerd from James Bond who makes bazooka <laughs> pens in a lab is now going to encompass all the bravado and sexual dynamism that Freddie Mercury had and then I started thinking about it, I'm like I kind of could see him transforming I bet he can do it, yeah. into yes I'm ready to say it, the greatest lead singer of all time I'm a huge Van Halen fan I love Aerosmith I love the Rolling Stones Freddie Mercury is the best front man that ever lived wow. you know it's it's funny I I'm going to disagree with you about the title of the film because when I think about it, it reminds me a lot of the Joaquin Phoenix, Johnny Cash biopic, Walk the Walk Line. The line. Yeah. It, which was, you know, you hear that line, Walk the Line, you know Johnny Cash right mm -hmm. away, but it also very much, that's describing Johnny Cash. And, and that's why I like the idea of a title, Bohemian Rhapsody. You hear that as a title, you instantly know you're talking about Queen and Freddie Mercury, and it also really is kind of a descriptive part of his life. So I kind of like the title. I agree. I actually love the title because I think that it, it that that's, you, you're a big music fan. Like you, you. I like to rock. You would watch, like, no <laughs> but no matter what, if you knew the Freddie Mercury movies, kind of whatever it might be called, you're going to see it. There are people that know Bohemian Rhapsody, know that song. Mm -hmm. And that will absolutely, they'll, they'll, they'll hear that and go, oh, is that about the, the like, because look at Creed, by the way. The movie Creed is coming out. And, I thought you were talking about the band. Uh, look that, at that's Creed. my point. <laughs> that's, that's my point, though, is because that, and when you say, I can't tell you how many times I've said, I've said I'm going to go see the movie Creed. Is that about the band? I, Can I have you gotten, take me higher? Just alone singing it, though. Um, but, you know, so, so I think by putting Bohemian Rhapsody to get that conversation on to know that it is about Freddie Mercury and Queen, I think it's a must. All right, folks, we reached that part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her ass, she's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. Then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Ashley, what do we got? Last week, it was revealed that actress Alexandra Daddario was in the running for a role in the upcoming Baywatch movie, which we already know will star Dwayne The Rock Johnson and Zac Efron. Today, it appears it's official. The Rock took to his social media to announce the following. It's official. Want to welcome the talented and gorgeous Alexandra Daddario to the cast of Hashtag Baywatch for the role of Summer. Alex is a one-of-a-kind woman I know from experience and can't wait for you what? guys to see her <laughs> on the role. <laughs> 
<laughs> my thoughts exactly. All right, the hashtag Baywatch film so far consists of a tatted up bald guy named Rock, the cool yet extremely unattractive Zac Efron, <laughs> the talented and gorgeous Alexander Daddario, and some big casting announcements coming soon. And just wait till you guys see who we cast for the iconic role of CJ Parker. Mark, buy or sell the official casting of Alexander Daddario in Baywatch. It's a buy for me for all the reasons that Dwayne just listed. I mean, he's worked with her before she was his daughter in San Andreas, which is going to be a little creepy if they're making out on the beach. But. No, no, I want them to be boyfriend, girlfriend, <laughs> making out on the beach, and I want him to say, call me daddy. Oh. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> what I want to see. an earthquake happens on the and beach an and the lifeguards happens. have to save everybody. Yeah, uh, yeah it's, a, it's a huge buy. Daddario is a credible actress, and she definitely has the assets necessary to play Summer in a Baywatch movie. As far as the C.J. Parker tease goes, I bet it's Pam Anderson. I'm 100% with you. Right? I'm to I'm totally know that's what And you got to have a Hasselhoff cameo in there somewhere. You cannot make this movie unless David Hasselhoff is like, yeah, me and my man boobs are going to show up for at least one scene. <laughs> Christian? I hope it's Margot Robbie playing C.G. Parker. That'd be, that'd be, that'd be That would be a coup. Yeah. That would be a total coup. We're just three dudes in a treehouse. What if Margot Robbie <laughs> playing? <laughs> wow. 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 What do you think? <laughs> um, I, I think that this is a great addition. I think she's awesome. I think that not only is she extremely attractive and fits the, the Baywatch model type, but she's a really good actress and she's super likable and and i watched san andreas again it's a fun dopey movie i love i really enjoyed watching it both times i've seen it and her and the rock had good chemistry as dad and daughter i, I don't want I, and it would be weird for me if they yes played. you do yeah. deep yeah. down I, you do I, no. I don't know where what, what happened to you this morning but uh <laughs> but it is uh it, it's it, for me it's it's a it's on a really good move yeah i look the thing about, like, is Alexandra Daria one of the most beautiful, hottest women in the business today? Yeah, she is. But here's the thing, as a Canadian kid moving down to Los Angeles or from wherever the hell you Miss Greens are from. Ralph's. When you come here, the, one of the things you learn real fast, and I often tell this to, like, uh, we interview a lot of people and whatever, and a lot of beautiful women come in to, to apply for different things. But one of the things you learn real fast is in this town, really hot, beautiful, attractive women, I kid you not, are a dime a dozen. Alexandra Daddario is talented. Yeah. She can carry, almost, you, you look at from her playing in roles from something as light as uh, Percy Jackson, and she plays that really fun and light and well, and she can come across as younger, then she pops over to something like True Detective, and she totally sells you what she's doing there. Like this, and she was one of the best parts of San Andreas. Oh, yeah. I mean, she actually acted the role really, really well. It was almost, it almost didn't fit in the movie. She acted right, it so well. Right. You know what I you're mean? Like, you're supposed to be bad. Yeah, right? exactly. Don't, well? don't, this is an earthquake movie. Yeah. You know that, right? Um, and so that is the reason, if anything else, to get excited. Look, and this also tells me a little bit something about this Baywatch movie. It's going to be an R-rated comedy, yes. But they could have gone with almost any Victoria's Secret model that they want to. If they just wanted to be dumb and whatever, they could have done anything. But they decided instead to go out and get a true actress who can actually bring something to the table. And that makes me even more excited for this movie. So I'm pumped for it. Is The Rock a producer on this movie? I, be I believe I heard he was. It could be wrong. No, well, no, it would make sense. It would make sense because he's the type of guy that like, he, he also, the thing with him is that he also recognizes talent. And he also knows like from working, he, he probably had a say in bringing her on oh, I'm sure. as well yeah. too. So it says a lot about him you know, as far as the producer role. Yeah, and you guys have seen more of Alexander Daddario's work than I have, but I'm willing to do the research. So I guess I'll watch <laughs> that True Detective scene and just see what an actress she really is. How about the whole arc, I, not just I mean, the scene? I don't have time for the whole movie. Ah, <laughs> Mark Ellis. <laughs> All right, what's next? <laughs> An official teaser trailer for the upcoming sequel, Now You See Me Too, has just hit the web. The four horsemen return for a second mind-bending adventure, elevating the limits of stage illusion to new heights and taking them around the globe. One year after outwitting the FBI and winning the public's adulation, with their Robin Hood-style magic spectacles, the illusionists resurface for a comeback performance in hopes of exposing the unethical practices of a tech magnate. The man behind their vanishing act is none other than Walter Harry Mabry, <laughs> a tech map prodigy who threatens the horsemen into pulling off their most impossible heist yet. Their only hope is to perform one last unprecedented stunt to clear their names and reveal the mastermind behind it all. John, buy or sell the new teaser for Now You See Me Too. I, before I say buy or sell, I'm going to say I'm, I'm uh, one of the guys at the table. I did not like the original. I thought that was a totally missed opportunity. It was a great concept, a great cast. And I felt just badly executed. And I, I didn't hate the film, but I walked out of it not being impressed. I didn't like it. 
And I haven't had a lot of enthusiasm for the new one. I've liked some of the new casting. I love the idea of Daniel Radcliffe as Michael Caine's son. That's pretty cool. But still not a lot of hope for the film. But I got to call, call it as I see it. I buy this trailer. I thought it was a well put together trailer. Just taking it on its own value, I watch it. It had me smiling. There were some exciting scenes to it, some scenes that made me think, I want to see the whole context of this shot and what they're doing here. That's pretty cool. And it made me more interested in seeing the movie, which is exactly the job of a trailer. So I have no choice, even though I didn't like the first one. I got to say, I buy this trailer. Chris, what about you? I buy it as well, too. Although I think that it looked, I, I, I liked the first one more than you did, but I didn't love it. I thought that it, it was fine. And it, it's actually, I think, a better cable movie than it is a, a theatrical release. But the trailer looks exactly like the first one did as far as tone and everything too so that's that's why i don't i don't think that it surprised me as much because they, with the minus the addition of daniel radcliffe but it looks like another just telling of these characters and i'm curious to see and i don't want to ruin the first one for you but to see the progression of what happened with mark ruffalo's character will be interesting so yeah i'll buy the trailer me three. I'm buying it too. I, I like that all the original cast is coming back. You get to see Michael Caine and Morgan Freeman back again. I love Morgan Freeman's line where he's like, I think that that first movie was just act one. And it's like, oh, well, what else do they have up their sleeves? The first movie, I agree with Christian. It was a great red box. It wasn't a great movie, but I had fun watching it. And I think I'm going to have a lot more fun watching this one. Daniel Radcliffe in this film is just hysterical. There has to be a Harry Potter joke in there somewhere, right? There's got to be. All right, what's next? The first official images for the new comedy, Central Intelligence, has just hit the web. In the Central Intelligence movie, Kevin Hart plays a former high school sports star <sighs> turned accountant who, on the eve of a class reunion, is contacted by a former classmate, Dwayne Johnson, who used to be a bully loser, but who is now a contract killer for the CIA, and who wants Hart's character's help to foil a plot to sell classified military secrets. Christian, after looking at these new pictures, buy or sell Central Intelligence. Uh, <laughs> uh, I get your wild out. Tentatively buy it again because of The Rock, and I, I think that I, I don't buy Kevin Hart as a football star. I'll tell you that. that that's that, athlete. That, athlete. Athlete. Okay. Um, Maybe ran track. Yeah. Wrestled. Wrestled. You could have wrestled. I don't know. Um, but I, yeah, it just the, the, the image just it, it could be really funny, or really stupid. But I, I'll 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 buy it by that much sell yeah sell yeah. I, i'm a big fan of the rock in the right context i can be a fan big fan of uh kevin hart as well um this just looks stupid i mean who, we'll watch it maybe it'll be the most amazingly funny greatest thing ever i am a fan of both of these guys but the description sounds way too formulaic I've seen a thousand times uh this looks like a movie that's better suited for the late 80s yeah. this looks like a desperate attempt to pull off an arnold danny devito kind of vibe I, I don't know, but there's nothing about this that appeals to me. So even though I'm a fan of both of them, I got to sell it. It does have a Twins vibe, or more recently, the other guy's vibe. And yeah, so I'm yeah, going to yeah. buy it ever so slightly because the pictures made me laugh. Is it going to be a silly, formulaic comedy? It probably will be, but I like seeing The Rock in a comedic role. And I love Kevin Hart. I think that he he's hysterical in every movie he's been in. The movies haven't been great themselves, but I think Kevin Hart is a guy I keep giving chances to because he makes me laugh. All right, what's next? Now less than three short months away, the upcoming Fox film Deadpool continues to push mm -hmm. out odd and unconventional marketing. New images have surfaced revealing a 3D stand-up poster of sorts for Deadpool, featuring the Merc with the Mouth wearing Santa's hat and sitting on his chair with the words, sit on this, written above him. <laughs> The new standee will be popping up in movie theaters across the country this week. Mark Byers sell the new Deadpool standees. It's a huge buy. I love that Deadpool just lampoons whatever is going on until the release of his movie. Christmas would be another one. I think will probably mock Star Wars at some point in a trailer or some other thing. This is who the Deadpool character is. I buy everything about this. I'm looking forward to taking a selfie with this in a movie theater soon. His Halloween, the, the, the oh, did you see so that good. Halloween yeah, thing that Ryan Reynolds thing. put yeah. out? That was so mm -hmm. freaking, look, I'm honestly to the point, and this might be a bad thing about their marketing. I'm to the point now, I don't care if the movie comes out. Just give me another year of every <laughs> every couple of weeks, put out some new kind of cool marketing yeah. like this, and that'll entertain me just as much. I almost don't care about the movie. I gotta buy it. This is mm -hmm. this is fits in perfectly with what they've been doing with the marketing so far. The motifs sit on. I can't wait to go into a theater and see that actually there. That's going to be awesome. Yeah. That's going to look great. So for me, it's a buy. It's a huge buy for me because it also tells people who don't know who Deadpool are exactly who this character is. Like yeah. When you look at that, it says, sit on this. You're like, 
okay, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> and you get interested in him right away. I agree with you guys 100%. This is, this is, it's been brilliant marketing all the way around from the way they announced this thing, the, the rated R PG 13 thing that they did, the, the Halloween video, really smart. And it's, it's going to keep coming until we get, I want, I'm looking forward to seeing what they do for new years. That's it's all this stuff. It's, it's really smart. Yeah. It's Fox realizing that we've been so inundated with serious superhero movies. When you have ads for stuff like age of Ultron or Batman V Superman, where you can lampoon that stuff, that stuff a little bit. And Deadpool is the perfect character to do that with. So it's genius marketing. Yeah. I, I it's, is the marketing though, let me ask you guys this. Yeah. Is the marketing getting our hopes a little too high? Because now I'm, I'm going to tell you, six months ago, just knowing that a Deadpool movie is coming, you could have given me almost anything. And I just would have been glad, man, it's a Deadpool movie. These marketing bits have been so good and so effective that I'm afraid my expectations are getting too high because I'm going into this thing now not just expecting a good little fun. I'm expecting to laugh my ass off from start to finish. Is that a danger here or no, am I thinking too much about it? I, I think you're thinking too much about it because I, th I think that it, it's, it's, it's really setting you up as far, again, like you have to let everyone know who this is and what they're doing. And it also shows you we've got a lock on who this character is. Yeah, I think you should yeah. be confident going into it because we, we haven't had this version of Deadpool yet ever. And we're getting the version that everyone loves about him. And it's and people who don't know him are now going to see that. And I think that this is the way to do it because they're not giving you it's when we start seeing the trailers that we should say whether or not we're, uh, we're yeah, nervous. But I think this is really smart. Because the trailers now have to make us laugh, too. Yeah. And not just impressive with the action. We have to think this guy's funny as well as a kick-ass superhero. All right, folks. Well, listen, it is Thursday, which means it's time for us to talk about what is opening this week. Brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. Three major films opening this week. One of them was Hunger Games. We talked about it on the Tuesday. But there's two more coming out this week that we need to tell you about. So, Ashley, what is up in theaters this week? First up is the comedy The Night Before. For the last 10 years, lifelong buddies Ethan, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Isaac, Seth Rogen, and Chris, Anthony Mackie, have gathered on Christmas Eve to celebrate the holidays with a bang. As Isaac prepares to become a first-time father, the friends realize that their annual traditions is coming to a sad end. To make it as memorable as possible, they plan a night of debauchery and hilarity by searching for the holy grail of Christmas parties in New York. Next up is the thriller The Secret in Their Eyes. Rising FBI investigators Ray, Chewy Tell Edjo for and Jess, Julia Roberts, along with Claire and Nicole Kidman, their district attorney supervisor, are suddenly torn apart following the brutal murder of Jess's teenage daughter. Thirteen years later, after obsessively searching for the elusive killer, Ray uncovers a new lead that he is certain can permanently resolve the case and bring long-desired closure to the team. But no one is prepared for the shocking and unspeakable secret that follows. John, which of these new movies are you looking forward to this week? I'm actually looking forward to both of them a lot. Um, um, the night before is one when I first heard about it, thought, ah, this could go either way. And then I saw the first trailer and I was sold, completely sold on this movie ever since. Um, the Secret in Their Eyes is one that's kind of snuck up on us, but the cast is so strong with Julia Roberts, Nicole Kidman, Shua Chala Gia uh, I, I cannot help but be excited for it. So for me, I'm excited about both. Christian, you've seen both. Yeah. Which one should people be looking forward to the most? The night before. Uh, it, it's the look. You're right about the cast with the secret in their eyes, but the the problem is that it it, it turns out to be more of a lifetime movie slash uh, episode of Law and Order. That it just you're watching it. You're you're you really you're rooting for Ezra for the whole time. But then the sub stories, it just it just really loses a lot, and it's it's silly at points. But the night before, for me, I was expecting an okay comedy. I got some really good laughs out of it, and you go to see this movie for Michael Shannon. Michael Shannon and Seth Rogen is the funniest he has been in years. Um, so two of those, there's some really great, a lot of great jokes. The chemistry between Seth Rogen. Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Anthony Mackie, and Anthony Mackie should be applauded as well too, because he really he comes in with two guys who've had chemistry before in 50-50 and knocks it out of the park. Yeah, but come on, Secret in the Rise isn't a Lifetime movie; it's an Oxygen movie because at least <laughs> Lifetime movies are a little bit entertaining and they move at a nice clip. This one is just such a drip to watch. It's got a great cast. Don't get me wrong; the performances are fine. The Secret in the Rise really disappoint me. So I was looking forward to this for a while. Ever since I saw a trailer, I was like, "Ooh, that's going to be a thrill ride. I want to see that picture. I don't think you need to see it in theaters." The night before, on the other hand, is hilarious. And when it's a raunchy comedy like this, you want to see it opening weekend with the crowd. I think you're going to laugh a lot. And like Christian said, all three of the leads are funny, but Michael, Stan and Michael Shannon steals every scene he is in. Watch it for him alone. 
Well, speaking of uh, the night before, we were lucky enough to have the director of the film, Jonathan Levine, actually come in here to our Collider Video Studios to sit down and talk with us about the movie. Our own Christian Harloff sat down with him to discuss the new film and his place in it. And we're going to show you just a little clip from that conversation right now. Check it out. When I was talking more about crazy stories, not necessarily just like off the set, like yeah. maybe something that like happened that you, maybe you guys just stuck directly to the script, but I'm just saying like sometimes I, I feel like, especially with those guys, something happens in the improv. Oh yeah, I mean, we barely did the script. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> okay. yeah, honestly. I mean, we, you know, the script was a guideline for us and the script was, you know, when it, when it would impact plot and stuff like that, we had to do it, or, <laughs> or character. Um, you know, so some of the scenes that lean more heavily on the dramatic side, are scripted, okay. but any scene that is meant to be uh, a primarily comedic scene was completely, completely improvised. That's and that says a lot, as, as I guess for you as well as a director, to where it's and it's, I'm sure it's refreshing to where you know you can trust your talent to just say, okay, you know what, this is what almost like a Curb Your Enthusiasm type thing too, yeah. where you're like, this is where we need to go. Yeah. We need to hit this. Let's get there, right. and then let's go. Right, and yeah, I mean, it was. It was a little scary at first, but yeah. then once I realized that they were going to give me so much more than what was on the page, it was just like, okay, cool. You right. know, you guys just go for it. I mean, it's not just these three guys. It's Jillian, it's Alana, it's Lizzie, it's Mindy. Yeah. Like, those guys are all expert improvisers, and they're, a lot of them are writers themselves. So why not? You yeah, know? It, you know, and we, like I said, with the ensemble as well, it, it, everybody lent to the scene. It didn't seem like anybody was one-upping each other. Everybody served the story well. All right, remember that movie, The Night Before, opens in theaters this weekend. Head on out and get your chance to see it. Well, it's that part of the show now, folks, for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Now, for those of you who are watching us live, and there are thousands of you watching us live right now, if you can get some of your Twitter questions on live right now. How do you do that? Simple. You make sure you're following us on Twitter, at Collider Video, and just tweet a question into us. Ashley's monitoring the uh, Twitter stream right now. She will pick out which questions get on the air at the end of the show. But for now, let's get to the mailbag. So, Ashley, what do we got? Brian Demanskis writes, Ever since The Wolf of Wall Street broke the profanity record with its 500-plus uses of the F word, I've noticed a tendency in many R-rated films since to use absurdly high amounts of profanity. On average, it seems an R-rated film released today will have 100-plus F-bombs. Why do screenwriters do this? If anything, I've found that less language in a film makes the use of it more dramatic as opposed to redundant. Do people truly find that profanity makes a film better? To me, it only alienates needs large amounts of viewers. Thanks very much. Um, no, I mean, look, the, the thing about language is just, it's like any other tool. Do guns make a movie better? Like if you bring a lot of guns into the 40-year-old virgin, does that make the 40-year-old virgin better? No. However, do a lack of guns make Commando better? No, Commando needs guns because that's the type of movie it is. That's what it needs. You know, I did, I did a, a film myself uh, called The Anniversary, and there's a lot of swearing in my movie, The Anniversary, but the reason there's a lot of swearing in is because it literally came from real conversations that me and the dudes that I hung out with actually said in the way we talked. It's just, that was just real life. You know, when you look at a movie like Godfather, or The uh, Goodfellas, let's say, and you look at um, the, one, the Joe Pesci character, for example, once you understand that character, to not have language coming out of his mouth would feel out of place and feel weird and feel odd. It would not fit the tone of what the movie is meant to be. Now, you said that language would alienate a large part of the audience. I disagree. I think it alienates somebody, but here's the thing. Anything in some movies will alienate somebody. Does a movie have violence in it? Well, that's going to alienate some people. Does the movie have some sexual situations in it? That's going to alienate some people. Well, does the movie have language in it? That will alienate some people. Somebody once said, and I use this phrase all the time, if you try to, to please everybody, you'll end up satisfying no one. So filmmakers need to make their movie and tell their story and then use the appropriate tools that they feel work in that story and use it. You know, we often said on this, like some people would ask us, why does everybody want comic book movies to be dark? Did they just think being dark makes the movie better? And the answer to that question is no. Making a movie more dark does not make it better unless it's the kind of movie that really does kind of need the darkness into it. So it, it all depends. So I don't believe there's any hard, fast rule for anything, for action, sex, language, any kind of stuff like that. It's, is it appropriate for this film? Now, you mentioned Wolf of Wall Street. 
It was totally appropriate for Wolf of Wall Street. It fit in Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. And Wolf of Wall Street would have felt odd understanding the flavor of it had it not been there. So it really all depends. But I agree. There are some movies that just throw in extra violence for the sake of violence and it doesn't work and it doesn't fit. They throw in some sex or nudity when it doesn't fit and it doesn't work for the movie or they just try to throw in a lot of language just for the sake of throwing in language that doesn't fit, but there is a place for it. At least that's my interpretation of it. Mark, how do you see it? That was it? a great point. And <laughs> I, uh, I, I like, I don't mind F-bombs when it's in something like Wolf of Wall Street or Goodfellas or an action movie. When it bothers me is when you're using it to try to be funny. When the line on itself isn't funny enough so you feel like you have to throw an F-bomb in there. And there's a movie that I enjoyed a lot this year called Spy, but one of my one of my problems with it was that Melissa McCarthy is just dropping too many F-bombs and it takes away the punch of it. It didn't I believe, fit. I believe if you're if you're showing a movie or you're you're doing stand-up or in real life, if, if you save the F-bombs when you really want to accentuate something it hits so much harder and so sometimes in comedies that's when it bugs me but you're right if the character speaks like that then I can buy it on screen it's just easier for me to do it when it's an action film or a drama than a comedy Christian yeah I agree with you guys and I think that it, it if it serves the story like you brought up Wolf of Wall Street and Goodfellas that's the way I imagine that all of those guys were talking and, yeah and like when you walk into that room that's what you were going to hear now a movie that I remember being excited about that was rated R um, was remember semi pro with Will Ferrell? Yeah, that movie shouldn't have been rated R. It didn't no, work. It, it, it didn't work. And another movie recently just came out was uh, was Crimson Peak. Like how the 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 violence in that movie, like the it was really at points were so gratuitous that I didn't think it was necessary. It seemed like there was that one scene that made it an R rating. You didn't need that. You didn't scene. need it. There, it was like it was so it was. It was intense and it was powerful, but I, it wasn't necessary to tell the story. And again, throwing back to like Goodfellas when they're stabbing the dude in the trunk, that that happened. That was necessary. And there's other times that not not that, that's a true story. Now there are other times that it, that it, it rated our film that it works. Bringing up like the Matrix and stuff too, the violence and stuff that happens in Matrix, <laughs> it all fits. Um, so yeah, I agree with everything that you guys said. As long as it fits in context sometimes they're they're pushing it to push in and it's not necessary and you could pull back but i think sometimes a movie uh, it is in, is kind of held back because the audi the studio wants a movie to have that audience of the 13 14 like for me the first and this makes sense and i understand why they did it but the first hunger games if you read the book is very dark and brutal and it's a rated r book you have to make that movie PG-13, obviously. Yeah. But you could have, if you shot a rated R version, it would make sense to shoot that as a rated R with the blood, with the extra violence, all that stuff. You know what would be really funny is if in Star Wars, if they finally see Luke, then Luke's like, what the fudge are you guys about to do? <laughs> they just start dropping F-bombs in Star Wars. You know right. who's great at dropping F-bombs and you might not know it? That girl right there, Ashley Mova, can drop. I an try That's to tell of people all, time. all the time. <laughs> Bless I your try heart, to tell Mark. people all the time mm -hmm. about her, and nobody believes me. They think I'm just such an angel. This little facade she puts on. <laughs> but all she the uses time. it right. Like she doesn't. She doesn't do it constantly. I mean, it's it, it's a lot, but she 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 accentuates the right moment. Uh, she can really pepper in some bad language. You guys, you guys, I love you guys. <laughs> all right. Well, I said we would use the last part of the show. Take your guys' live Twitter questions, and we're gonna do that right now. Once again, make sure you're following us on Twitter at Collider video tweet those questions in and maybe you'll see it get on here on the show so ashley what have you picked out um timothy plate writes what movie did everyone hate that you kind of enjoyed this year <laughs> oh that we kind of enjoyed this, this year. year i will start it off with yes. the wedding ringer everyone hated that i thought I it was so funny yeah i got a kick out of that one yeah, yeah, that one. yeah. yeah i gotta admit i i it was i did not like it as much as i was hoping i was going to yeah um, what, what would be one for one of you guys um there's a movie i think like. i think they got more of a lukewarm reception that i enjoyed watching for what it was that was uh, our brand is crisis i thought it had really good performances and i liked watching sandra bullock and billy bob thornton go back and forth the movie tried to be a little bit too much but anthony mackie was also great the entire team that was helping this political campaign and the guy who's running for president i can't remember his name but he's in a lot of good movies. He's in Clear and Present Danger. It was a good, fun movie to watch. I thought people hated it unnecessarily so. Well, I'll prove your point there. I hated that movie. <laughs> you didn't hate it. <laughs> I, it stinks. Um, um, I, I'll, I don't know. I'll go... Um, now, I'm, this is a movie I found 
to a degree oh. likable. Okay, I'm not. This is one. Oh, I love. No, I, I I liked this movie that everybody else hated was Terminator uh, Genesis. Um, um, uh. Terminator Genesis was one I thought there. I thought there were some amidst uh, all the crap. There, I found some redeeming qualities. Had some fun with it. Uh, wouldn't be one that I would jump up and down and defend. I wouldn't defend the movie to anybody because somebody says says to me, convince me I shouldn't hate this movie. I'll just go, dude, I can't. I just simply can't. I, I just got a little bit. So that's one for me. What about you? Burnt. Uh, I think it's got like 20% on Rotten Tomatoes. Oh, yeah, I, like I really enjoyed that movie. It's it's cliched, but I, I guess the same thing with Southpaw is cliched as well, too. But people hated Burnt. I was looking. I couldn't believe how many people hated that movie. But yeah, I liked it. All right. What's next? Elisha Wright writes, what do you guys think of the new Spike Lee joint, Chirac? I didn't I see it. Don't, I, I didn't it. see it. Yeah. Gotta see. We'll get back to you. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, Alex, uh, Chris Alexa Coase writes, what is the best dark film you've ever seen in cinemas? Oh, best dark film. Well, dark City? No. Oh. Um, everybody has a different definition about what dark means. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's the, the the traditional dark comedies, or you know, uh, you know we just mentioned Goodfellas, mm -hmm. which while there's entertaining parts and, and funny parts, it's a freaking dark, deep black as the abyss movie. I mean, really at the heart and the soul of it. Yeah, I'll say uh, Prisoners was one that. that oh, that's I saw a good the one. Yeah, because I don't have kids, thank God. I like to. I, I, it's not like as uh, big of a mental hurdle for me to jump over and just be into this world where I think if you had kids, you probably shouldn't see that movie at all. And one that just comes on cable every so often that I enjoy watching for whatever reason is Very Bad Things about a group of guys. That's that the go other to one Vegas I was thinking of. Yeah. And they, it just bad stuff happens, and it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse, and it makes me laugh. Like I'm the maniac by myself laughing. <laughs> Daniel Stern going through all this stuff. Um, seven for sure. And um, uh, what's the other one I was just thinking of? Shoot. The Cat in the Hat. No, I think for me, yeah, <laughs> a Seven absolutely is, is a movie for me that I think it's it's super dark and I could just, I don't know, that that, that was a theater going experience that, oh, and Natural Born Killers. I think Natural Born Killers no, is another yeah. one that ah. it's, it's, I know it's got more of a satire feel to it as well too, but when you look at what the subject matter it's is, so, it's dark. Yeah. When you uh, saw Seven in the theater, were you pretty freaked out? Because I didn't see it in the theater. Like, I didn't yeah. know what the twist was, but I saw it on home. I think it's just, it's a different experience. We actually see the box scene in the theater. It is, what's in the box? What's yeah. in the box? Yeah, it, it's, it's a creepy, it's a a creepy movie, but brilliant. You know, I'm sensing a theme here. Ash, Ash, can you hold up your, your phone for a second, your phone case? Why? I, I'm just wondering if there's a coordinated effort here because Wait. yesterday Sinead came on the show and she was wearing a pizza sweater. Yeah, we we both pizza. love pizza. And seriously, was this a coordinated thing? Is this no, a we're just love so connected. Pizza? If you oh, okay. hit one on that phone, is it called Domino's? And two is like Pizza Hut and three is Papa John's. I wish. Can we order I pizza? Wish. I'm I think actually we can. very hungry. We Let's did that, that last night. Let's order pizza. Do All right. Now. What's next? <laughs> All right. It's Rashad H. writes... Are there any particular actresses that you'd love to see in the female Os in a female Oscar in a female Ocean's Eleven reboot? I want Ooh. Halle Berry and Angelina. Two um, good ones. Emily yeah. Blunt. Uh, yeah, Emily Blunt, who's a name we go to a lot because she's just so freaking diverse. She can do whatever she wants. I, we already mentioned uh, Alexandra Daddario. Right. I think she would fit in well. She could do some pretty cool. Rebecca Ferguson. Uh, Rebecca Ferguson, Jessica Chastain. Yeah. You know who's really um, good in uh, in Charlie's Angels, and she's good on Sherlock. Is is it is it Lucy Liu? Um, and uh, yeah. What, and um, uh, I think Octavia Spencer would be funny in like. Uh, in, Carrie in, in Washington kind of would be good. Carrie yeah. Washington would be good. Uh, Scarlett Johansson. Yeah. Lisa yeah. yeah. Don. From uh, yeah, from yeah, yeah, would be good too. Ashley, uh, what? Ashley would be good. Yeah. Oh yeah, thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> What's next? Samuel Varg writes, "What is your favorite magic movie? Mine is The Illusionist with Edward Norton." Oh man, you know what? If it wasn't for the ending, which I wasn't really big on the ending very much, I would say hands down the Prestige. Yeah, Prestige. I love. I just the the ending just didn't click for me. It wasn't yeah. the right ending. So the Prestige is a really good one. The Illusionist is also a very very good film. Uh, certainly not now you see me. Um, <laughs> but maybe the sequel. Uh, maybe the Incredible Burt Wonderstone. Oh. No, no, no. but that's that's yeah. one that I that I actually enjoyed that a lot of people hate. I didn't love Colonel Burt Wenzel, but I did enjoy it. Um, you know what? By from lack of anything else, I can pull off at the top of my head. I'll have to go with the Prestige, I guess. Um, does what's that? What's that one? The um, the Glass House with Hayden Christensen is that what it's called? So what's the one? What's the one that he did? My Life as a House. No, what's the one that he did? Yeah, Life as a House because it made it made a scene that he can act. Is that magic? Yeah, well, that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Little rough on the setup, yeah. but good punchline. Yeah, yeah. Didn't even remember the name of the movie. You knocked it out of the park. What's and didn't need to use an F bomb, kid. There you go. I'm going to say, doesn't the Labyrinth count as a magic movie? I mean, there's a lot of magic stuff going on in the Labyrinth. But are we Labyrinth. talking about fantasy? Or are we talking about like real world? Like Labyrinth is in the real world, John. A kid got kidnapped from the real world into the Goblin Kingdom. We got to go get him. I'm not going to argue with you. All right, what's next? <laughs> Perry Chandler writes, what movie has had the greatest use of viral marketing minus Cloverfield? Oh, yeah. Clo uh, that, yeah. It's, before she even finished the question, I was thinking Cloverfield was a really great one. Uh, obviously, we're seeing Deadpool yeah. like crush it with that stuff and all the stuff he's doing the on X -Men, YouTube. X-Men Days of Future Past had a pretty good one. With, Did uh, it? Yeah. With the, I remember. It was like the, the setup of the mutant sites and, and all that stuff. That was pretty cool. Oh, yeah. yeah that was actually pretty yeah, good. Jurassic too. World did a pretty good job of that. And uh, District 9, I believe, had some pretty cool uh, yeah. marketing stuff, too. Yeah. No, or humans only and all that kind of yeah. stuff that they did. Yeah. That was pretty good. All right. Let's take two more. All right. Thomas Bergstrom writes, what 80s song would you like to see on the new mixtape as the GOTG, GOTG2 soundtrack? And what track do you think will be on the trailer? You spin me right oh, round. Oh, that's baby, right, actually right. yeah. <laughs> that's gotta be. Um, so you got to put some Duran Duran on there. Yeah. If you're gonna talk the eighties, there's gotta be some Duran Duran. You got to get a little bit of maybe pour some sugar on me. Would have to be in there, I think. You're just waiting to say Van Halen, yep. so I'll go over yeah. to you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I gotta go with my heart here. I think Jump is such a perfect song to put on. Jump the would be a great one song. on it. Another one would be Working for the Weekend by Loverboy. You put some Ario Speedwagon on there. How is Journey not on the first mixtape? Put Don't Stop Believing. <laughs> put Faithfully. You might fall in love with somebody. There's a lot to play with here in the eighties. How about Huey Lewis? Go back in time, dude. Can I Power tell? You, he could die right now. He's been waiting for as long as he's been on the show for that question to come in. So he lit up. Look at him. It's a great era in music. It's Billy Joel, Uptown Girl, might be on there. Oh, no, Uptown Girl is totally one that could be on there. That's right. One of the funniest scenes in Step Brothers is when Horatio Sands, as the lead singer of the Billy Joel cover band, yells at the crowd, we only cover 80s, Joel. But so I got to say, if you're going to ask me then, what will the trailer song be? I think it'll be Don't Stop Believing. I think th I think that's the trailer song for Guardians mm. of the Galaxy 2. Yeah, if it's an 80s song... Uh, I'm, okay, then I'll, I'll, I, I think that's right, but since I want to bet against you, I'll go with Speedwagon, can't fight this feeling anymore. I would love Only the Young beyond, as for Journey as well, too, because they, uh, he always, he was referencing, Starler was referencing a lot of 80s movies. I love a Vision Quest reference in there as that well, too. That song is so synonymous oh, with Vision Quest. Oh, Danger yeah. Zone. Danger Zone's good, too. That's a great one. Danger Zone, okay. Last question of the day. Daniel Chappie writes, what is your favorite gangster movie? Uh, I got to go Goodfellas. Oh. I, I mean, it sounds like a stereotype. I gotta go Godfather. Mm. I gotta go Godfather. I'll go Mafia, the uh, the spoof with uh, Jay Moore. <laughs> you know, no. you know, you not. You know, here's here's one not a lot of people seen. If you know, if you've ever seen um, either the first Mortal Kombat or what you should really know him from is the Highlander. Uh, but uh, Christopher Lambert, yeah, he has a little gangster movie called The Sicilian. And uh, I would recommend checking it out. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not going to put it at the top of my list, but that's that's a little treasure that I think a lot of people haven't checked out. It didn't get great reviews when it came out, but I actually think it's a little treasure of a, of a gangster kind of film. So I would say check out The Sicilian. All right, folks, that'll do it for us for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us today. Listen, don't forget, lots of great films playing out at our friends over at AMC Theaters. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater showtime and, of course, your movie ticket information. And hey, folks, it's November. Why am I not shaving at all? Because it is No Shave November, just to raise awareness for cancer research. If you got a couple extra bucks today, maybe instead of going to McDonald's or to Chili's, wherever you're going to go today, take those couple extra bucks and donate it to cancer research today. Very few things in this world you could do that would be better used with your money. I want to thank the people sitting at the table with me. First of all, sitting over here, Mr. Mark Ellis. Mark, where can people find you online? If you want more 80 song suggestions for Guardians of the Galaxy 2, <laughs> follow me on Twitter at 5150 Ellis. Later today, I'll be on Jedi Council with Christian and John. And I'm in Omaha this weekend doing stand-up at the Funny Bone Friday through Sunday. I'm headlining Sunday night. Get your tickets now. Uh, and, oh, by the way, rock the bell with LL Cool J. Sitting over here, Mr. Ooh. Christian Harloff. Uh, today, we have Collider Jedi Council. Like Mark said, it's myself, Mark, and John. We were covering a lot of things that happened this week in the world of Star Wars. If you're not watching, please do that today. And make sure you hashtag Collider Jedi Council. Get your questions on the air and follow me at Christian Harloff on both Twitter and Instagram. 
And of course, our lovely host today, the pizza loving Miss and pretty foul mouth, Miss Ashley Mova. <laughs> Ashley, where can people find you online? On Twitter and on Instagram at Ashley Mova. Happy Thursday, guys. And if you want to know how foul mouth Ashley Mova can be, we got a video coming out here pretty soon. Oh yeah. Just, just keep your eyes open for it. You're gonna you're gonna see something. And uh, most of all, thank you to you guys. Remember, the most important part of our show is not what we have to say at this desk. It's what you have to say. Jump into the comments section and leave your thoughts on any or all the topics we discussed here today. You can follow me on Twitter or on Facebook simply at John Campia. And that'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. And until next time, bye-bye. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.